Philippians. So Psalms chapter 4, <coughs> I would, um, really what we see here in this, this chapter is four different types of people. And when you look at it, you see, of course, uh, the sons of men there in uh, verse 2, which says, O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? So uh, that's one group. And then, of course, in each one of these groups that we're going to look at tonight, and then we'll kind of make application at the end, we see that each one of these groups also has uh, a certain desire, that there's something that they want. And here with the, uh, with, with the sons of men, of course, what they desire is vanity. They love vanity. They seek after leasing. So that's your first group. And then you also have another group, which is the many that desire good. If you see there in verse 6, it says, There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up thou the light of thy countenance upon us. So that's kind of their prayer. And I would say that these are probably, uh, y you know, you could refer to them or apply them to be, you know, backslidden or, as we'll see, unseparated Christians. Because really that's what this chapter is about, the benefits of separation. And that's what I would call the sermon, the benefits of separation. And we see that second group there is those that, you know, they know God, they're calling him Lord, and, but they are desiring good. They're saying there's no good that comes to us. You know, they seem a little downtrodden. They seem like they're missing out on something. And then, of course, the third group would be him that is godly. You know, this would be the company that David is in. He's the one making the prayer. And we would say that these are those that are separated unto Christ. You know, him that is godly, God has separated unto himself. And he's the obedient, separated Christian who's living the Christian life the way it ought to be lived. And, of course, he benefits from that. And we'll see that here in a minute. It, and, uh, <laughs> uh, of course, well, let's just jump right into it here. Um, you know, our desire should be to be heard of God. You know, that's the desire that the obedient Christian had. You know, that's the, the desire that David had, the one that was separated. You know, he said in verse 1, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. You know, the, the obedient Christian, first of all, they understand that there's a need for that prayer. You know, often when we're the ones that are trying to live a separated life, trying to live godly in Christ Jesus, we real, start to realize how short we come. And we realize when we stumble and we fall, we make mistakes. And we're going to be the ones that pray this type of a prayer that would say, have mercy upon me. You know, hear my prayer. That's the desire of that group. You know, the desire of those that, um, you know, are, are backslidden, are disobedient, they're not separated. You know, their desire is to be heard of the Lord, right? They, they're saying, uh, uh, you, you know, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. They, they want God's countenance. They want God, the light of his countenance upon them, but they don't have it. They want to be heard, and yet they're not heard. And then the third group, of course, being the godly, they are heard. That is also their desire, but the benefit being that they are actually heard. And, you know, this, this idea that of being heard by God, you know, in prayer, the, the desire for mercy or the things that we need, and we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more. You know, it's, it's a privilege that's often taken for granted by many Christians. You know, in fact, sometimes it's just all together just forsaken. You know, it's not even something that we do and we kind of say, well, it's nice that I can do that, but it's not a big deal. A lot of times we just don't do it at all. You know, we don't pray, we don't take advantage of what we have in Christ, to come boldly before his throne, to find mercy and help in a time of need. But let's look at it, first of all, group by group here, and make application at the end. Group one, of course, again, is the unsaved sons of men who desire vanity, they desire leasing. It says in verse two that they seek after leasing. You know? And you know, that word leasing isn't something you see. In fact, you only see it here and then in the next chapter in scripture. It's not something that's used anywhere else. But what we understand leasing is, whatever it is here, typically what I would imagine it's alluding to is, you know, they are profiting from somebody. You know, they're profiting off of people through leasing because that's what a lease is, is to, you know, bind somebody in an agreement usually involving, you know, a some kind of a financial, you know, arrangement. You know, we lease this building, for example. We agree to pay rent if we skip out of town and, you know, leave the rent unpaid for that amount of that, the length of that lease, they're going to take us to court and small claims, try to get that money, right? There, there's a, and I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong in, in every instance, but that's what these men desire. You know, that's all they're concerned about in life is just getting money, profiting off of bringing, you know, making deals, cutting deals. And again, you know, business is business. It's not a dirty word, but, you know, that shouldn't be all we desire in life. We should desire more than that in life. But of course, you know, you could also say that maybe these guys have a little bit more of a, it could be that they have a little bit more 
uh, you know, nefarious intentions. Like maybe they're more, a little bit more malicious about the way they're going about. No, it doesn't say that, but that type of thing certainly exists, doesn't it? You know, there are people that desire leasing in the sense that they desire to bring other people into bondage for financial gain. You know, to reduce other people and their lives to just sources of income. And, um, you, you know, one example of that comes, you know, of course, is the, the prison system that we use in this country. That's something that, you know, we, we, we bind people literally, you know, and then we put them in cages a lot of times to make money off of them, you know, and then keep them bound even beyond their release and keep people paying for things that, you know, should be forgotten. That's a whole other subject. You know, that's probably not what's going on here, but it could be that they were in violation of God's law of the release. You know, maybe he's looking at these people and seeing that they're not observing Deuteronomy chapter 15. I won't go into it, but if you recall, that was where God commanded that at the end of every seven years, they would make a release. Those that were in debt were to be forgiven all debts. Lands were to be returned. That's the jubilee, excuse me. That's when lands were returned. But it said there that every creditor that lendeth ought, lend ought unto his neighbor shall release it. That was every seven years. He shall not exact it of his, of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. So it could be that maybe these guys that are, you know, they're, they're, they're making these agreements and they're not agreeing to, to break off these leases after seven years. Because, you know, the fact is there was a lot of things that God commanded in the Old Testament that Israel did not do. You see God commanding it, you know, in, in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and, and so on and so forth. And then you hear, the, you, you read about the story of the children of Israel and just a lot of it, they don't ever, you don't read of them about them doing it. And of course, that was why God took them into, uh, into bondage because they didn't observe, they didn't give the land its rest every seven years and so on and so forth. So it could be that these guys, maybe that's what they're guilty of, you know, bringing other people into bondage for financial gain, which is a practice, you know, that God would condemn. You know, he would say, hey, you can't just hold the people at this perpetual state of debt, you know, without end. It has to be every seven years you let them go. Wouldn't that be a great system? Well, hang in there. It's coming. It's called the millennium. And the irony of that is that, you know, there's no need for that type of thing because the Lord promised Israel wealth if they were obedient, if they observed his commandments, like the year of release, that he said he would greatly bless them in the land which the Lord thy father has given to thee for inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken the voice of the Lord thy God to, to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee. So that's the irony there. You know, if that's what these guys are, they, delay, they, love land, uh, they love vanity and they desire leasing. If this is what it's talking about, you know, it's unfortunate for them because they could have had that wealth and loved the Lord at the same time. And I'm not saying that if we love the Lord, we're guaranteed to be, you know, prosperous. This isn't like a name it, claim it type of thing. But God does bless obedience, you know, once in some, some shape or form or another. <laughs> so, and then again, of course, it says in verse 2 that they loved, uh, that they loved it and it said, uh, how long will you turn, it starts in the beginning, how long will you turn my glory into shame? So that's what they did, and it seems like the way that they did this was through their love of vanity, through seeking after leasing, so maybe that's kind of what leads me to think this is what they were up to. They were in violation of this in some way, right? <laughs> that's maybe it's perceived as having turned his glory into shame, because that would have been his glory. If they would have kept all his commandments, if they would have obeyed the Lord thy God, and he would have blessed them, and other nations would have seen that, and they said, wow, they're blessed of God. You know, who, who's, who, who, you know, you know, what nation had the God like this, whose laws are so perfect and holy? Look how he's blessed them. They're prospering. They would have inquired of the Lord. God would have received glory, but instead they've turned it into shame. You know, I, that's kind of how I, I read that. <coughs> and then of course, you know, such leasing, as it says there, is vanity. He says, you know, how long will you love vanity and, and seek after leasing? It's whatever they're doing, it's the same thing. He's equating this leasing with vanity. You know, desiring to be rich, desiring to make gains off of other people to profit in life just financially is vanity for several reasons. You know, one is because it cannot satisfy. It cannot satisfy. And if you would, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's a familiar passage, but it cannot satisfy leasing. It's vanity. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Saying, look, you love money, you're never going to have enough. People who love money and want to get money, they want more money. It's never going to be enough for them. They're just going to want more silver. You know, and it cannot deliver. This is another reason why 
seeking after leasing or making financial gain is vanity because it, it cannot satisfy and it cannot deliver. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from the day of death, from death. So riches don't profit in the day of death, in the day of wrath. That's not really what matters. Jesus said, what shall a man gain if, she, if he shall gain, what shall, what shall a man be profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, the, whatever riches you gain in this life, they can't be compared with having heaven as your home, being saved. It, it can't even come close. And, 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 he, and Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man to pass through the eye of a, or excuse me, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say it was impossible. He just said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He said all things are possible with God. You know, it takes a miracle for this type of thing to happen. Just showing you how hard it is for rich people to get saved because they trust in uncertain riches, as it says in 1 Timothy. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. It doesn't deliver. In fact, ironically, wealth and riches and prosperity actually leads to bondage. It's the complete opposite. You know, people think, you know, money is going to solve all their problems, you know, and just an it's just going to be the answer for everything. It's not. You know, ironically, it actually leads to their bondage. It says in verse 9, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some cov coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So what, Timothy, what Paul is saying here in 1 Timothy is that when you, when, you, when you become rich, when you desire to be rich, when all you want is to be rich, that you fall into a temptation and snare. And it sounds like, you know, a snare, you know, bondage. It sounds like what Paul is saying here to Timothy is that, you know, you need to remind these rich people, or pe actually those that desire to be rich, rather that are not rich, they just desire to be, is that you should be careful what you wish for because you can actually get into a lot more trouble with money. You know, there's some sins that, you know, you and I are just never going to be able to partake in because we don't have the money for it. You know, we're just not going to, or we're not going to go to the degree or the excess of certain sins because we just can't afford it, you know. And people who desire to be rich, you know, the, often what they end up finding out is that they've just fallen into temptation and a snare. They just open up all these doors to all these sins and they can't handle it. It's just too much temptation coming at them at once. Now, this, notice again, it says they that will be rich. You know, that doesn't mean that every rich person, you know, is just some wicked reprobate, okay? But those that desire to be rich. You know, those that have, you know, gotten wealth through, you know, hard work, you know, laboring, you know, and building a business, so on and so forth, have made it by honest gains, you know, they typically, you know, can handle prosperity because usually that kind of comes a little bit at a time. You know, people that start a business usually start, they're the only guy in the truck. You know, they're the only one running out making the calls at midnight and, and, and then slowly it builds up, you know, and maybe they have a down season in their business and it shrinks and they have to build it back up again. And then when it finally turns into, you know, a very profitable business employing several people, you know, by that time they've learned how to handle money. They've learned you know, how to, you know, give God the glory for it and have been industrious and worked hard for it and they realize it's just not all about them, you know, sitting back in the pool with a drink in their hand, you know, that they're, they're providing for other people and things like that. You know, and that's another sermon, but again, that's kind of the point that First Timothy is chapter 6. That ties in with Psalms chapter 4 because he's saying, look, one of these groups of people, the sons of men, not the sons of God, the sons of men, they desire vanity, they love leasing, and it's vanity. It can't deliver it, 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 it's, it can't satisfy and ironically leads to their own bondage. Now let's look at the second group, okay? And the second group was those that desire God's blessing but don't have it, right? And, and, and you know, this turns out, this is probably the majority of, you know, Christians today because it says, David said, there be many that say, you know, and remember David's living back in the time of, you know, the Old, you know in Old Testament Israel, people are, know the Lord and things like that. Uh, they know the God of Israel. And yet, despite that, David is telling us here that there are many that say, who will show us any good? Like, God, where's God's blessing? You know, who's showing us any good? All we see is oppression and hardship. And they're crying out and saying, Lord, you know, they're calling him by his name. They're saying, Lord, lift up thy light, thy light of, thy of thy countenance upon us. So, the second group are those that desire God's blessing, but don't have it. And today we could say that these are the backslidden, unseparated Christians that surround us. 
that are everywhere today. It might, it might even be us ourselves at times in the Christian life. You know, maybe we would find ourselves in this boat. <coughs> Look there in verse, uh, verse 6 again. He's saying, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. And here's what I want to I draw some application here. And if you would, go over to Proverbs 18. Is that these people, they desire good, right? It's not that they're, you know, disregarding God or they just don't care. They're desiring it. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of sad. You know, <laughs> they're saying, who will show us any good? It's like they're looking for somebody to show them good. They want to be blessed. They don't love vanity. They don't love leasing. They desire somebody to show them some good. They're even crying out to the Lord. Lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. You know, and you have to think about what, what is it saying by lit the, the light of his countenance, you know, desiring the light of his countenance. He's saying they want, they want God to look at them and to take notice of them. You know, God is light. You know, his countenance. That's talking about your face. Lift up, you know, look at us. See us. Help us. That's what they're crying out here. And here's the thing. If you desire light, if you want God to look at you and take note of you and, and care about you and show you good and bless you, if you desire the light of his countenance, right, you desire light, well, then you have to walk in the light. You know, <laughs> we, have, we must go to it rather than expecting it to come to us all the time. You know, we get out of sorts with God and we're kind of just over in the corner sucking our thumb. You know, this shows me any good. You know, why isn't God blessing me? Well, because God's over there and you're over here. You need to quit throwing the pity party and get in the light with God and get in his light and he'll see you. And it's not that he doesn't see you. It's just like, I'm not just not, I'm, he's saying, God's just saying, I know you're over there, but I'm not looking over that way. You need to be where I'm looking. You know, we need to get in the light if we want the light. That's what he's, John said in John 1, chapter 7, 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. But that's an if there. If we walk in the light, meaning that it's possible to not walk in the light. Like these people, you know, who desire, they know the Lord, they're calling him by his name, they're desiring his good, they want the light of his countenance, but they're not in the light. They're not walking in it. So it's good to have that desire, you know, and, and often, even when we're in our most backslidden state, we'll find ourselves saying, I want God's countenance upon me. I want to be in the light. You know, we even have that desire, but, and that's great, but here's the thing. Desire must be accompanied by action. Desire is not enough. You'll never get in the light just by wanting it. You, you know, you have to walk over there <laughs> and stand in it and then walk in it. You know, that's all proactive. That's all you having to do something. You know, and Proverbs 18 ties into this in verse 1. You know, and this is, this is a verse that, you know, <coughs> I've heard preached and, and explained, and it's, it's, it's made an impact on my life. It, and, and it's this idea that a desire is not enough, okay? Because it says there, through desire, so it's through desire, right? Everything starts with desire. Desire's good. It's good that even these people here in Psalms chapter 4, they desire God's countenance. They want good to be shown unto them. That's good, but it's not enough. Through desire a man having separated himself. And that's the major theme of, of Psalms chapter 4, separation, okay? Those that are separated and those that are not. Having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You know, those are, you know, verbs. Those are actions. Separating himself. Seeking, right? These are telling us that this is something that we do on our end through desire. And that's how we gain wisdom. That's how we gain instruction. That's how we gain the light of God's countenance. You know, because he is the source of all wisdom. And it's interesting that last one that he uses there, that he separates himself, he seeks, but not only that, he intermeddleth with all wisdom. And of course, we would apply that by saying the wisdom of God, right? That's the wisdom that we want. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so on and so forth. That's the wisdom that we want, you know, God's wisdom, not not earthly wisdom, not the wisdom of this world. We want God's wisdom. And, it's that, and I'm saying all that because, again, it ties in that word with intermeddleth. You know, intermeddle means to interfere with something that is not one's concern. Kind of like that term meddle. You know, he's a very meddling person. You know, the person who's always getting involved in things that aren't his business, you know, trying to get in there and find out what's going on with people and give his opinion. He's a meddler. You know, he's a, he's a, a do-gooder, Right? Same, same sense of the word here. You know what that tells me? Is that God's wisdom 
it's really not ours. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that doesn't concern it. We have to seek after it. You, you, you see what I'm saying? It's something that we have to go after. It's not, it's not that it's none of our business. It's just that typically it's not something that we, mankind concerns himself with. Mankind typically doesn't want to intermeddle. He, he has his own affairs. He has his own ideas. He has his own philosophies. And he's going to do his thing. God has his wisdom. And if we want it, we're going to have to go intermeddle with it. We're going to have to have the desire to do it. We're going to have to separate ourselves. We're going to have to seek it. And we're going to have to intermeddle with it. And it's really not something that comes naturally. Wisdom does not come naturally. It belongs to God. You know, it's his business. He's not saying, hey, stay out of my business. I'm just using that to, you know, uh, make the point that if you want it, you got to go after it. You know, you got to, you got to get nosy with God, if you know what I mean. You know, you got to kind of interject yourself into that relationship. Instead of you know, just sitting back and waiting for God to just come to me and teach me all, you know, God's not just going to, you're not just going to go to sleep on your Bible one night and wake up with, with all the wisdom of, of God in your mind, in your heart. You know, you got to get nosy. You got to get your nose in the book. You got to open it up and get your face in it and, and read it and start to get in God's business and get involved and get your hands dirty. And that's when God starts to give that wisdom. It all starts with desire, but desire is not enough. It requires action. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if we desire, if you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When you get there, put a bookmark in it, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If we desire the light of God's countenance upon us, we must separate from the vanities of the sons of men. Because we, like them, like the sons of men, can turn God's glory into shame. Okay, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Because again, this is this this chapter is about separation. Okay, that's really what it's about. You know, know that know that he that that God uh, that God has separated him that is godly unto himself. The Lord has separated him that is godly unto himself. He's saying, know this. That's what this chapter is about. And he's showing us these three groups of people. Those that aren't separated, those that have no desire to be separated, and those that are separated. Now, those that desire God's blessing but are not separated, they also, in a way, turn God's glory into a shame. Okay, let me, and, and I think we can do that today by taking the glory that is Christ in us and defiling it, okay? specifically through certain sins like fornication. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, Know ye not that your bodies are the member of Christ? Shall I then take the, body, the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So he's saying there that your bodies are the members of Christ. Right? That, 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 that Christ is in us. Okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I'll begin reading in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 3. It says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have ye of God, and ye are not your own. So he's saying here, look, there is no more Old Testament temple. That doesn't exist anymore. But when it did exist, what was there? What was in the tabernacle? What was the purpose of it? To see the glory of God descend upon it. That's where the glory of God dwelt on earth. I mean, it would, at times, it, the, the, the glory of God, the, you know, it, his smoke filled the temple, his smoke filled their tabernacle, and they couldn't even go in. They were afraid. I mean, that was God's glory dwelling on earth. But the Bible's telling us in the New Testament that we are now that temple. Those of us that are saved, we have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. We have that glory in us. The glory of God abides in us. And I'm just saying tonight that if we don't live a separated life, we can be just like these sons of men in Psalms chapter 4 and turn that glory into shame by defiling it through certain sins, specifically fornication, which the Bible speaks a great deal about. He said in verse 20, uh, well, let's back it up to verse 19 again. What, know ye not that their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You say, well, I don't like that. I don't like that I can't fornicate. Well, you know what? Ye are not your own. You know, and, and, and maybe you didn't think about all that when you got saved, but that's the fact now. You know, Jesus Christ, when you, he, when you got saved, he bought you, he owns you. Whether you like it or not, you're his. You're his temple now. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it's amazing to have the Holy Ghost dwelling within us, leading us into all knowledge that we can open up his word and understand it and, have a, and behold wondrous things out of his law and, 
and do great works for God. Go out and see souls saved. God can do all these things through us as his temple. But you know what? There's some stipulations that go with that. You know, they couldn't just go into the temple and do whatever they wanted back in the Old Testament. And we can't do whatever we want with the temple today and treat it however we want. He said in verse 20, For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. You know, don't turn it into shame. Don't seek after vanity in your life. Separate yourself. Do something meaningful for Christ and glorify God in your body. Don't be like the sons of men. Which, and he says, uh, verse 16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. That's a very stern warning. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? What's he saying there? That if you take this body as God's temple and just do whatever you want with it, you know, God is long-suffering and God is merciful, but it just might get to a point where God destroys you. And just says, well, if you're just never going to straighten up and fly right, I'm just bring you home. Like the old, the old joke, right? Some of God's children he brings home and he crowns them. Other of God's children he crowns them and brings them home. Right? That's what this is saying. Look, we can live a separated, godly life. We can glorify in our God and our body and in our spirits. We can do great things for God and go home and receive a victor's crown and receive rewards in heaven and so on and so forth. Or we can defile the temple of God. We can turn his glory into shame and suffer the consequences. He said in verse 18, so well, I don't know about all that, you know. Well, let no man deceive himself, verse 18. If any man seemeth among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. You know, what is he saying here? Desire God's wisdom. Separate yourself from the world's wisdom and seek after it. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their craftiness. And again, the, world know, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Right? The sons of men, their, their, their glory is shame. Everything they, the, the, the wisdom that they have, the wisdom of this world, it's vanity. <clears throat> so we are gods, whether we like it or not. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, 22, verse 20, Ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify your body, God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. He's saying, look, that body is not yours. It's God's. He already owns it. Oh, this is my body, my choice. Wrong. It's God's body. He bought it. He made it. So that's the kind of the second group there, right? Those that desire good, but don't have it. The many which desire good. The many that know the Lord, that desire good, that want the light of his countenance, but don't have it. Why? Because they don't want to separate. They don't want to walk in the light. They want the light to come to them. But let's move on to the, the, the third group, and that's the one I want to spend more time on this evening and make application here, is, is the third group. Verse 3, him that is godly. Okay, him that is godly. The obedient, the separated Christian. So in order to be godly, notice here in verse 3, we must separate. If you're back in Psalms chapter 3, or four, rather, verse three. He said, but no, okay, no, <laughs> but know that the Lord hath, hath set apart him that is godly for himself. So who gets set apart unto the Lord for himself? Him that is godly, okay? And this idea of separation or sanctification, you know, which are uh, synonymous terms, they mean the same thing, basically. To be separated is to be sanctified. You know, you're, you're, you just note, note that word in your Bible reading, sanctification, sanctify, sanctified. You'll see that in Scripture, how often it's used in that way, that they were to set apart, they were sanctified certain off offerings unto the Lord. It was set apart unto Him, okay? I don't want to take the time to explain all that. It's pretty easy to grasp. If you kept something in, in second, or in, go over to Second Corinthians. You're going to want to keep something in the New Testament. We're going to be there a couple times. But he's saying here, the Lord that has set apart him that is godly for himself. Say, well, I want God's... Con okay, you know, I'm tired of the vanity. I'm tired of the way of the world, the sons of men, and all the vanity that they love and seek after. You know, I want God to do good unto me. I want the light of his countenance to be upon me. Well, then you know what? You have to be, you have to be separated. And it's not, it's not optional. It's commanded, okay, to be separated, to be sanctified, to go through that process. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. 
He said, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord. Of course, in the bigger context there, you know, he's talking about, you know, coming out from among the heathen, the unsaved, and he becoming a father unto us. But same thing can apply even in the Christian life, that we need to be separate under the Lord and not touch the unclean thing in order to be received by God. You know, God doesn't want to deal with dirty things any more than we do. Okay. Go over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We'll see this a little bit more. I'll read to us from 1 Thessalonians 4. It says in verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So again, he's getting real specific about what this godliness is. He's getting real specific about what the separation is, what the sanctification is. And it's not just this, you know, abstract idea. It's not just this, you know, holy air that we put on. I'm sanctified. There's, you know, specifically he's getting in that you should abstain from fornication. He's getting real specific about it. You know, there's a lot of uncleanness in that. Okay. And he's saying, look, you can't have anything to do that. If you want God's blessing in your life, fornication is, is, is a no-go. And in fact, it's one of the few things that the, that the church has authority to kick you out of for. You know, if you're found out to, you know, 1 Corinthians 5, go read it. You know, if any man, you know, is a, if any, bro, if any man that's called a brother be a fornicator, to have no company with that man. You know, we, he's to be put out, to be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, the Bible says. Unless he repents, it gets right, okay? That's the goal. But that is the will of God, okay? You know, a lot of people get, you know, get wrapped up and go, I just want to do God's will for my life. What's God's will for my life, you know? I want to know God's will for my life. Okay, abstain from fornication. You're doing God's will. Be sanctified, be separate, be godly. That's God's will for your life, you know? And, and, but, and that should be enough, you know? And the rest of it, God kind of leaves the finer details up to us. But look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. So it's the grace of God that has brought salvation that is teaching us. Okay, get the context. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and he had something to say, right? Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know, that is the will of God. That's what God wants from us. That's what, is what he is teaching us. To live righteously, to live soberly, to live godly in this present world. Looking, verse 13, for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Of course, it's saying that because Titus was a preacher and Paul is writing to him and saying, these are the things you need to preach. Living soberly, living righteously, living godly, living separated from worldly lusts. He said, teach these things, speak them, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So what we see here is that the same grace that has appeared on no man that teaches us this denial of ungodly lusts is also warning us that we're going to be despised for it. And anybody that you know, tries to start to implement godly standards in their life, tries to actually live the word of God in their life, will know this is true. They'll start to see the fact that they will be despised for what they believe by the world. And that's why there are many that be there are many that say, who shall do us any good? Because many people, that's where they draw the line with God. They say, you know, I love God. I'm glad he saved me. I'm on my way to heaven. But this whole thing about separating and having to hold these standards and live this type of a life, it's a little extreme for me. And you know what? You can do that. But you know what you're going to end up saying? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Why isn't God looking my way? Because you're no longer in the light. Because being in the light is separating from the darkness of this world and the ungodly lusts that are in it. And, and he's warning us in Titus. He's commanding us, look, you have to do these things. And he's telling Titus, you have to teach and preach these things. But understand that this same thing is going to bring, you know, you, you cause you to be despised in the world. And if you would, go over to 1 Peter chapter 4 and bookmark 1 Peter chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 1 of 1 Peter 4. It says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... 
Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. <laughs> this is a warning. You know, he's preparing them. He's saying, look, just like Christ suffered in the flesh, he was persecuted, he was hated, he was despised and rejected. Arm yourself with the same mind. Meaning this, get ready. If you're going to live for God, if you're going to live the Christian life, you might as well just mark it down and get ready that you are going to be despised and hated and rejected and persecuted also. And that's what Jesus taught. If they hated me, they will hate you also. The servant is not greater than his Lord. <clears throat> and he says there in verse 2, let me carry on there. He says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, verse 1, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Verse 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. You know, when we arm ourselves with the same mind and we say, I'm not going to live the, the rest of my life in the, in the flesh to the lust of men, but I'm going to live unto the will of God. I'm going to be sanctified. I'm going to be separated. I'm going to be godly. I'm going to walk in the light as he is in the light. The people around you that you, set, that, that you used to do all those things with, they're not going to go, oh, good job. We're so proud of you. We really appreciate you having a higher standard and getting out of all this sin that we're involved in. Good for you. That's not what's going to happen. It says, wherein they think it's strange. What happened to you? Uh, who is this? What have you done with my friend? You know, they think it's going to be an invasion of the body snatchers or something. What are they teaching you in that church? Does that preacher get up and wave a watch in front of you for a half hour before he starts talking? They're flashing lights? You know, they think you're possessed. You know, there's, you've been hypnotized. You've been brainwashed. You know, whatever it is. You're in a cult. Yeah, we're in a, we're, it's a cult that kicks people out all the time. It has people leaving and we're like saying, good riddance. <laughs> we're such a cult. We're glad you left. We're such a cult. It's funny how many people get out of it and say, you're a cult. And we're like, we're glad you're gone. <laughs> but we're a cult. Okay. Cults don't tell you to read the Bible and think for yourself. Okay. I don't. Anyway. They're going to say, they're going to think it's strange. Look, if you arm, you got to arm yourself with the same mind. That if you're going to live unto God, if you're going to live unto the will of God and not the flesh, you know, the, the, the lusts of the world and the lusts of men, you're going to live a vain life, you're going to live a godly life, you need to arm yourself and understand that they're going to think it's strange. The world's going to persecute you. Even those that are closest to you, who you used to run with, they're going to, they're going to think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. And they're not going to stop there. They're not just going to say, oh, well, I guess they've changed and move on. Then it says, speaking evil of you. Did you hear what so-and-so is up to? Do you hear that church? Do you know what their, who their preacher is? Do you see him when he said? And what, you know, then they're going to start to speak evil of you. <laughs> you know, and that can be a... And, and, and then you start to understand why there be many that say, who shall show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of that. Now you can understand why there are many Christians today who don't want to live that separated life. Because it comes at a price. And that's what the Bible's saying here. It's, it's clear as day. And, you know, that can be a very, and, and I mean, humanly speaking, you know, if we're just looking at it from a carnal th way, you know, that we can understand that because if that's all you see in the Christian life, that is a bleak prospect. If we all consider only what we're leaving behind and we say, oh, the Christian life is just about me no longer walking in lasciviousness. Oh, I have to leave all the lust because, again, I'm, we're not stupid. There's pleasure of sin for a season. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. People just don't commit sin because it's, it's terrible and miserable. It's like, you know, trying to eat raw Brussels sprouts or something. You know? They do it because it's, there's pleasure in it. There's no doubt about it. It's alluring. That's why it's a temptation. <coughs> so, but if, if all we think about is all the good times we're leaving behind, when we're, we're saying, I'm going to separate and live for God, and boy, I have to leave behind all this fun sin, all this pleasure behind... Yeah, that is, if that's all you're, the only way you're looking at it, that is a bleak prospect. And then you probably will go back to that. But the trick is to not just look at what you're leaving behind, but you have to consider what you're taking on. You know, you have to lay hold on eternal life. 
You need to start considering spiritual things and let the, the reality set, settle in. That we are God's children. That God in heaven is real. He saved you. That he's coming back. You know, there's all these just phenomenal spiritual truths that if we would just dwell on and think on, you know, those other things would just, we'd see them for what they are. Just lasciviousness, sin, banquetings, just, just vile things. Though they might have pleasure, they can't satisfy, they can't deliver, they lead to bondage. You have to consider not only what you're separating from, but what you're separating unto. That's the trick of, of the living a separated life. So many times when you hear the preacher start talking about living a separated life and living godly, all we tend to think about is all the things we're going to not do anymore. Oh, I got means I have to give up this and quit doing that and quit hanging with them and start doing this. And, or I'm sorry, leaving all this behind. We never think about the things that we're going to gain, what we're separating ourselves unto. That's the trick to the Christian life. You have to consider what you're separating yourself unto. And what did he say to t separate unto in Titus chapter 2? Zealous of good works. You know, we need to consider the good works. That's why if you're going to try and live the Christian life, by, you know, live a separated Christian life, but not do any of the works of the Christian life, it's going to be boring. And you're going to say, well, I'm just going to go back to this now. You need to separate from that and then take on the works. Because the works are what bring satisfaction. I mean, it is work, don't get me wrong. But when you put effort into, you know, learning the Bible, learning how to give the gospel, learning how to preach the gospel, and seeing somebody get saved, and you know they got it. I mean, when you do that, that they're, they're, I don't care. There is no pleasure in sin that can come close to that. The knowledge that you saved a soul from hell, it, it's incomparable. I mean, so here's the thing. You have to not just separate from all these bad things. You have to separate yourself unto something and what the Bible is telling us is that you need to separate yourself unto good works. And not just separate unto it, but be zealous for it. Go after it. Chase it. Get in the light. Walk in the light. Be zealous of good works. That is how you live a separated godly life successfully. <coughs> and you can't expect to live you know, a joyful Christian life by being passive. By just having this passive mentality. Bible says in Ephesians, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God didn't just save us to just set us there and say, wait. Just, just wait there and don't get involved in any sin and just, just keep to yourself and don't bother anybody. No, he's separated us unto good works to do something, to get something done for God, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's what we're here to do. Which tells me this is that separation is optional. You don't have to do it. I mean, if you want to be right with God, you have to do it. If you want God's countenance upon you, if you want to be in the light with Him, then yeah, you do have to do it. It's not optional. But it's possible to live the entire Christian life and not be separated. In fact, Psalm 4 said, there are many that say. Titus 2 said, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. So I guess, you know, the application and where I'm trying to drive home is, if you're stuck in this, in, in this part of the Christian life where you know you're supposed to be separated. You know you're supposed to kind of get away from this and get involved in that. And you're kind of doing this like, eh, what are the pros and cons? Well, let me, let me plead the case for the separated life tonight. You know, let me help you consider the benefits. What's it, like the, the car salesman, what's it going to take to get you in to the separated Christian life? What do I got to do? What do I got to tell you? All right, well, here's my best sales pitch, okay? Consider the benefits. Go back... Uh, Keep something there in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 4, actually. Uh, we may or may not be coming back. I don't know what happened there. But, <laughs> but consider the benefits. Go back to first, uh, 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 Psalms 4 and look at verse 3. He said, the Lord will hear me when I call unto him. Well, what's the big deal about that? Oh, I don't know. What's the big th deal about the Lord God hearing you. I mean, if there's anybody's ear that you've ever wanted to get, it's God's. I mean, we think it'd be a, a big deal to bump into some celebrity and get a selfie with them. But I'm telling you that as God's child, you have a direct access to the throne of grace. That God himself, the God of heaven, will hear you. I mean, 
Do I have to say anything else? I mean, what else do I have to say to get you to live a life for God? To get you to live a separated life for Him? Consider the benefit of answered prayer. The Lord will hear me when I call unto Him. And isn't that ultimately what those people wanted? The many that say there, be, there, uh, 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 there is none that show us any good. Lord, lift, uh, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. What are they saying? They want to be heard of God. And that's exactly what is available to them if they will be separated, if they will live godly in Christ Jesus. That's what's available. And there's just verse after verse after verse about this. Uh, you know, this is the confidence, 1 John 5, that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Look, when you're living the separated life, when you're, when you're living for God, the things that you pray and ask for are going to align perfectly with God's will. That's what it says there. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And, if we, and, and, and we know that if we ask whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. One of the benefits of the, God, of the separated Christian life is answered prayer. And that's one of the most amazing things that you'll ever see happen in your life. You know, people are always looking for the supernatural in, the, in their life. People always get caught up in the supernatural. They just want to see something otherworldly, right? Well, how about having God answer a prayer? Having God, you pray for something specifically, and then God just miraculously provides for it. It's amazing when it happens. Uh, you know, there's just verse after verse. The Bible says in Romans 5, we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 4, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Maybe it's not even just something or whatever that we need. You know, in the Christian life, there might, when you're trying to live that godly separated life, there's going to be times where you need a mercy, when you need help. You're going to have to go to God for that. And God is willing to help you with that if you'll come to him. You have that answered prayer. It's there waiting for you. <coughs> you know, that, but it has to be, you know, you have to live that separated life to do that. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 66, if I regard iniquity in my heart, what does it mean to regard something? You know, to esteem it, to, to give it place. I regard this. You know, I, like he said, uh, you know, uh, to disregard somebody. What is, you know, you're being dismissive of them. Right? So if you're regarding something, you know, you are acknowledging it. If I regard iniquity, you know, sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You can't live this wicked, sinful life and then expect to just pray to God and, oh, he's going to answer and hear all my prayers. No, that's one of the benefits of living a separated life. Answered prayer, having access, getting God's ear and being able to be heard of him. How about this? Here's another benefit. Gladness and joy. Right? That's what he said there in verse 7. <clears throat> Thou hast put gladness in mine heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine is increased. He's saying, look, who put gladness in his heart? The Lord. The Lord has put gladness in my heart. You know, so when we refuse to separate, when we say, well, I'm not going to be godly, I'm not going to separate, you know, you rob, us, you rob yourself of real joy in the Christian life. <clears throat> How about this one? I'll wrap it up for sake of time, but separation brings peace to your hearts and minds. Look at verse 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. You know, a lot of people today, they're laying to bed at night and they're wide awake. And they're worried about what's going to happen to their Roth IRA and their 401k and Who's going to get in the White House and what's going to happen to the economy? And is coronavirus going to get me? And what about those murder hornets? And, you know, <laughs> are there going to be riots? And everyone's, people are just worried. All the, and even beyond that, you know, those are just like a lot of things that we can point to today. But just life in general, people worry and fret. They don't lay down like, the, like David here and lay down in peace and sleep and just put their head on the pillow and doze off sweetly. <clears throat> Why? Because thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. People are worried about, you know, what's going to happen to them. They don't, am I going to be safe? Well, that's one of the joys, of, or one of the benefits, rather, of living the separated Christian life. You have all that. You have peace. You have joy. You have safety. That peace and joy comes from knowing that, you know, the angels of the Lord compass about them that fear him. 
that you have that God is going to protect us. You know, that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That we have the victory in Christ. <clears throat> but the Bible says, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I'm, you know, instead of, instead of spending our time, you know, indulging all these worldly pleasures, if we would love God's law and get into it, and, and, and love this book, you know what we'd have is peace. As we'd read the promises of the word of God and say, oh, that's mine. This promise is mine. This assurance is mine. It's mine. All these are mine. And I know it and I believe it and it gives me peace. <clears throat> and nothing shall offend them. They're not going to get worried. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So really to kind of conclude here, the spiritual benefits of a godly life, of a separated life, the benefits of separation are spiritual. They're not carnal. And they vastly outweigh any of the carnal benefits of a vain life. You can take all the benefits, and there's pleasure and sin for a season. There may be even be riches to be had. Wealth and abundance of things and certain relationships and activities. All these carnal things that a vain life can give you. And then you compare that to all the spiritual benefits that might not be tangible, but are eternal, and that are unique only to the Christian. You weigh those against these. I'm telling you, it's, it's just we don't see that because we've never really been over on the side sometimes. Or we haven't stayed there long enough to find that out and let it play out in our lives. He said, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than the time of their corn and their wine. And he's, he's comparing it. I mean, that's what David's doing here. <laughs> He's saying, look, I have gladness in my heart more than they do in the time of their corn and their wine when it's increased. You know, when they got the Welch's grape juice and the Kirkland organic brand tortilla chips in abundance. You know, and I love grape juice and tortilla chips. I mean, you guys saw me grinding down on those nachos, the little round ones they got over there. I don't know what it is, but round tortilla chips are better. They just taste better. Maybe it's a different corn, right? Yeah, I got an amen there. <laughs> I love it as much as the next guy, but you know what? It can't be compared to the gladness in my heart that God can give me. Those are just carnal things. You know what? The, the grape juice is going to run out. That, the, the, the bag of tortilla chips is going to be all crumbs. And who likes the crumbs? Oh, don't amen that, but you know, we'll eat them if we have to, right? But that's what David is saying is, look, I have more. I have the benefit of the gladness that I have in my heart. It's better than anything that the sons of men have, the va vanity that they have. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for Lord, thou, thou Lord only makest me dwell, dwell in safety. You know, the unseparated Christian may have, uh, you know, they might, ha may, they might not have the scorn of the world to bear. You know, and they might say, well, we're, we're just, we're going to be like them to win them. We're going we're gonna to find them where they are. We're, we're going to pattern ourselves after the world. And therefore, you know, we're not going to have to bear any of the reproach or the scorn. We're not going to have to get made fun of as, you know, those, those old fuddy doties down there at that IFB church. Where's your purple lights and your glass pulpit? Why doesn't your preacher wear, you know, graphic tees and holy jeans? And I mean literally jeans with holes in them. Right? That's what they're going to say. Well, you guys, you guys look like a bunch of... Whatever, you know, they're going to scorn and laugh and mock at that. And the, and the unseparated Christian who doesn't do any of that and wants to look just like the world, they're not going to have to bear any of that mocking or ridicule or scorn or, or you know, spite. They're not going to get the hate mail. They're not going to get the, all the persecution that comes with being a godly separated Christian. They might not have that. And that's a benefit to them. They say, that's what we wanted. This, this is the good life. But you know what they're not going to have is they're not going to be able to dwell down, to lay down and rest in peace and dwell safely because they're not God's not going to give them that because God only gives that unto them that are separated unto him that's who gets it in this passage that's who gets it in Psalms 4 that's who that's the group that David runs with him that is him that is godly that God has separated unto himself he's the one that gets to lay down at night and even though he has 10,000 rise against him he knows that he's perfectly safe only he gets to know that and really that's what this passage, and that's what I'm trying to drive home tonight. 
is that the spiritual benefits of a Christian of a separated Christian life far outweigh any of the carnal benefits of an unseparated life. And that's what the psalm is trying to drive home. That's why he says in verse 3, but no, no. Look, you need to walk out of the room tonight and know this, that this is the way it is in the Christian life, that the path to God's blessing leads through the door of obedience and separation and sanctification. And until you go through that, until you get through that door in your, in your Christian life, all these things are off limits to you. And you need to know that tonight. That's what the psalmist is saying. Know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. I want to be set apart unto God. I want, to be, I want to be God's. I want the light of his countenance in my life. Then you need to know that you have to be set apart unto him. And then the Lord will hear what I call. And again, this, that desiring, it's not enough. If we, trust, if we know this, you have to act. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. It's not enough just to know them. You've got to do them. Stand in awe. That's what he says in verse 4. Here's the action. You need to know this, and then you need to act on it. Know that the Lord has set apart himself that is godly for himself. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Separate from the sinful and sin and, and, and sin not. And you know, a big part of that equation is stand in awe. Stand in awe that we can be heard of God. Stand in awe that God will answer our prayers. Stand in awe that God is going to bless us and keep us safe and give us peace that passeth all understanding. Stand in awe, get in God's word and ask him to show you, you know, the behold, you know, wondrous things out of his law and understand that these things are yours and stand in awe of it. And then you'll have an easier time of sinning not, of living that separated life. You'll commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Separate from sin. Offer, and here's more action, verse five. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. In Romans 12, I'll close here, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's Romans 12. You know, we need to know these things tonight. And, we need to, and then we can begin to desire them. You know, stand in awe of them. Say, well, I want that. Then you have to do the action. It's not enough to desire. Through desire, a man seeketh and intermeddleth. Stand in awe, sin not, and offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Your bodies. So understand, my body is not my own. It's been bought with a price. It's God's. And I'm going to give it back to him. And whatever he wants to do with this life, Whatever he tells me I can and can't do in this body, in this temple that is his, that he has bought, that's what I'm going to do. Offer that sacrifice tonight. And maybe we'll start to see, if we do all that, maybe we'll start to see that being separated unto God, that living a godly, separated, sanctified life, sanctified life it's not a burden. It's a privilege. You'll understand it, that it is a privilege when you begin to consider the benefits of separation. Let's go ahead and pray.